We expanded access to the free and priority COVID-19 testing sites for first responders to now include grocery store and supermarket workers. Starting today, the men and women who provide critical access to food and other necessities can schedule an appointment to receive COVID-19 testing at the Gillette Stadium in Foxborough and at the Big E Fairgrounds in West Springfield. If someone wants to get tested, you can make an appointment in advance with your super by your supervisor or your manager, and you do not need to be symptomatic to be tested. I also authorize the activation of an additional 3,000 Massachusetts National Guard military personnel to support our COVID-19 response if necessary. This order raises the total authorization of up to 5,000 members statewide who may be tasked with supporting requests from state agencies for equipment, logistics, warehousing, and related duties. And many of the assignments they've got so far have also involved supporting our communities. We're taking these necessary steps to ensure we're doing everything we can to keep the residents of Massachusetts safe and especially our frontline healthcare workers. As we continue to take measures to plan for the surge, we continue to chase more personal protective equipment and we're working as hard as we can to make sure we have enough equipment to keep all frontline healthcare workers safe while still being able to support their patients. This remains one of the biggest challenges, but solutions like the one we're visiting here today will help us aggressively use every means necessary to make sure people have the gear they need. We found creative ways to track down more and more PPE and we'll continue doing so in order to get more to the people that are battling this disease head on. But today, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Mayor Joe Curtitoni, and I had the opportunity to tour, the, tour this facility, which houses Battelle's critical care decontamination system, which will be able to sterilize, when it's fully operational, up to 80,000 N95 masks per day. I'm incredibly grateful for the support we've received from Mayor Curtitoni in the city of Somerville, who moved heaven and earth under his emergency powers to team up with Battelle and partners and stand up this facility. This machine will keep more masks in use and will sustain our personal protective equipment supply here in Massachusetts. These folks have been working day and night to get this bill done, to test the system, and to mobilize it and make it operational, and we're thankful for their efforts. On the wall here is their list of sort of existing and prospective customers, and it's a lot of health care facilities here in the Commonwealth whose names would be very familiar to all of you. As of yesterday, Battelle also announced that the service will be free for Massachusetts health care providers thanks to a federal contract. Good things happen sometimes when people work together, and this is another great example of that. The machine is well on its way to being able to decontaminate more and more masks in the next week and will be available to any hospital and first responder system in the Commonwealth. But before I finish, I want to spend a minute talking about our efforts to ensure the COVID-19 information and services are available to people in all communities, including non-English speakers. Yesterday, we announced that our COVID-19 text alerts are now available in Spanish. You can text to COVID mass, COVID -MA -ESP to 888-777 to get those alerts in Spanish. As we've said before, the 211 line is available in over 150 languages, and all of the mass.gov slash COVID-19 website is available in 13 languages. We've also recognized that up until now, the unemployment assistance application process has been particularly challenging for non-English speakers because of the legacy UI form is not available in multiple languages like the rest of the mass.gov website is. The Department of Unemployment Assistance created multilingual guides to the application process to help meet this need, but we've been pursuing a better solution, especially during these times of high anxiety. And that's why today we announced the launch of the Spanish language unemployment application form. The form is available at mass.gov desempleo. It will ensure Spanish speaking residents who are struggling with the economic disruption associated with this virus can access unemployment services and benefits. We look forward to further improving our multilingual services for all residents of the Commonwealth 
And now I'd like to turn the podium over to our host, Somerville Mayor Joe Curtitoni, whose team did a terrific job of working with Patel and Partners to launch this machine. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Baker. Good afternoon. I also, first, I want to start off by thanking Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and his entire administration. You know, I, I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues across the Commonwealth when I say, one, none of us had a playbook in terms of pandemic response, and this is an effort that requires everybody working together. And I can attest that Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, have made themselves available numerous times a day. Uh, to seek collaboration, to seek ideas, to answer our questions, and that calm us down <laughs> a lot of times. So I thank them wholeheartedly. I also want to thank our, our partners in this, in this endeavor, our partners, Healthcare and Battelle, and Federal Realty Investment Trust, who owns this property. Although we utilized the emergency, emergency powers granted to me under our local declaration of state of emergency, they've been great partners in this endeavor, and they're not seeking any compensation. And I also I want to thank the governor for giving them a shout out, but I want to echo his words to the Somerville team for working around the clock. When we got the phone call from partners a little over a week ago, my team immediately went to work. We utilized our powers, we gained control of the site, and we went through the approval process so we can get the system here, which arrived last Sunday. And as you can see, they're up and running. And we know the importance of this. Uh, cleaning tens of thousands and sanitizing tens of thousands of these N95 respirator masks per day uh, help give the highest level of protection to our healthcare workers and we need to protect them because they need to care for us as we become ill. But this is also a very good example of how government, local, state, the private sector, innovation need to come together. Another good example of how we need to be nimble and move quickly and to act. And I think we've all done that here. So we're excited to have this system up and running, and it's going to help so many people in our effort to take on this crisis. Without further ado, I want to introduce from Partners Healthcare, Chris Coburn. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, uh, Mayor Curtitoni. A federal lead, really led, uh, represented today by Patrick uh, McMahon, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Paul Benninger, uh, Phil Licari, and others who've really worked night and day to get the system in place. Importantly, I'd like to recognize uh, Greg Durand, who's the site head for Battelle. I think we have about a dozen Battelle people on site. Greg is a Massachusetts native. He's uh, from the town of Hudson, a family well known in that part of the state. So thank you, Greg, and thanks to the Battelle leadership for backing us and making us the first site where Battelle did not previously have a facility that where this, uh, this uh, capability was uh, deployed. So, so in terms of Partners Healthcare, we're so pleased that we could play a role, in, you know, speaking for our CEO, Dr. Ann Klebanski, um, you know, bringing this innovative PPE uh, decontamination system here where it's so, uh, so needed, uh, it speaks right to the core of why uh, Partners uh, has embarked in this area. We currently require, according to Dr. Benninger, now it's gone up to about 25,000 masks a week. Uh, we expect that it will go to 45. This system and other tools will enable that growth and enable the, obviously, the protection of health frontline uh, healthcare workers. Um, you know, innovation is, is uh, whether it's uh, helping patients, protecting caregivers, improving, improving the delivery of care, is at the uh, heart of our, uh, our system and its mission. Uh, we're the largest academic research center in America. We have over 6,000 Harvard faculty who carry out about $2 billion a year in research. Another priority for us, and Mayor Curtitoni uh, referenced this, is, is collaboration with the Commonwealth, with the City of Somerville, with Federal Realty. And for us, so wonderful that uh, we could be uh, teamed with Battelle, two storied organizations coming together to help caregivers here in the Commonwealth and all through, uh, uh, all through New England, uh, folks like Dr. Bittinger. And on a personal note, I'd just like to say for having spent a combined almost 20 years at, at uh, Partners Healthcare and uh, Battelle, it's really a thrill to see uh, this uh, combination of our two organizations in this important way. So thank you so much. Any questions for us or these folks? 
Will healthcare providers be swinging by to, to drop off masks? Will someone be picking them up? How will that all play out? Sure, the question? Yeah. You, you need to answer it here. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Governor. So, yes, uh, obviously one of the challenges with up to 100 hospitals as accessing this system is is all those logistics. Uh, the Greg's team, our team, uh, again, captained by uh, Phil Licari, who used to run supply chain for Boston Scientific, uh, have uh, uh, optimized the system to, uh, to handle the flow from our hospitals and others around the state. Can you explain what we're... ...safety of the system, because the Massachusetts Association expressed concern that this is untested technology that was only recently approved by the yeah, I can speak to it, I, and others might as well. I would say, yes, it was approved by the FDA with very explicit guidance. Uh, that guidance notes the system and also the antecedents that led up to it. This is an area of expertise for Vitel that goes back uh, decades. They run chem and biological defense preparedness for uh, uh, a piece of the U.S. federal government. So without going into the specific details, the emergency use authorization was provided by uh, the FDA after a lot of back and forth. Uh, the, 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 I think the way it was explained to me, the masks that come out of here have the same level of decontamination as a mask that's purchased new from a manufacturer. So how many times can they be reused? In fact, Patel says up to 20 times. Last week, Secretary Sutter says it was up to 5 or 10 times. Yeah, I think, I think it is approved to go to 20 times. Patel did a lot of uh, preliminary work. Uh, I think the... Uh, at least speaking for our hospital system, we're confident being at that level. But the plan from a logistical standpoint is probably less and five to 10 may be a more uh, precise number, but it's good to go to 20. Can you explain what we're seeing and what's happening in, in each container? Uh, <laughs> happy to. So uh, uh, this is the uh, Battelle system, similar to one that was deployed uh, at, at the other sites in the U.S., the three original sites in in uh, Ohio, state of New York, and state of Washington. Uh, you have four trailers that have exactly, the, if you can see the numbers, one through four, and uh, Greg has named them in honor of sports teams, given his local roots here. Uh, each of these uh, have exactly the same role, and so as they ramp up, these will be running concurrently and around the clock. The Battelle team is staffed to operate these 24-7. So essentially, uh, masks come in, there's some sorting, they go on racks. The racks go into these units. Uh, the uh, the uh, treatment takes place over a period of about four hours. Uh, then the masks are repackaged for shipping back to the site of uh, containment, uh, of site of origin. I'm Can sorry. The same masks go back to who dropped them off? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They have their names on them. So um, I have a question about funding. It's crazy that the mask decontamination part is free now. I understand that partners uh, made an upfront financial commitment to bring the Mattel system here. Can you tell us how much money that was? Thank, thank you for that question. So two Sundays ago, uh, we heard, uh, we were on a conference call uh, early in the morning. We heard that Battelle had this system. We reached out to Battelle. Two days later, we had a deal. The deal was based on us committing to use the system. There was no uh, exchange of money of any kind. And now that the federal government is, uh, is uh, covering the cost, uh, we don't expect any, uh, any uh, exchange from us or any of the other hospitals. I, uh, the mayor can speak or the governor on that uh, front, uh, but uh, the cost, there was cost in getting the site prep, having the contractors here, uh, and a very close uh, uh, linkage with federal realty. Did you, you want to? From the city, I can tell you, we know there's no money from the city other than staff time and the administration, the governor, can, the administration can speak to COVID-related 19 expenses being reimbursed to cities and towns. So, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Federal Realty Investment Trust is kindly not seeking any compensation uh, for utilization of this building. I mean, keep in mind the the way this the federal government's grant isn't going to last forever, but it's going to last for a while, and that's a good thing. But eventually, uh, the way this works is you basically pay to have your gear decontaminated. 
Um, the price you pay to have your gear decontaminated, in most cases, is going to be less than it would cost you to actually go buy new gear. So, for all intents and purposes, it's an expense that would be incurred by healthcare providers anyway. I, d I do want to give Dr. Bettinger, who's sort of a leading authority on effect infectious disease, an opportunity to speak about the question that was asked about um, the validity of the process and the, and, the, and the decontamination system itself, because I think that's important for people to hear. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I would like to also add my thoughts uh, and thanks uh, to the Governor, uh, to Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mayor Kutter Tony, uh, uh, Battelle, and, and Federal Realty. Uh, th this really is an extraordinary opportunity to, to in continue to protect our healthcare workforce. Uh, we have uh, nurses, respiratory therapists, physicians, so many uh, clinical staff who are caring for patients. And uh, for so many weeks uh, and now months, you've heard uh, me say that we cannot buy enough of the personal protective equipment that we would like. It's just not there for purchase uh, and so uh, really even beyond cost it's just access uh, to the to the n95s and to have uh, an opportunity to provide more n95s to our healthcare workforce is, is absolutely essential uh, the technologies I understand was actually uh, originally tested and approved uh, in in, um, uh, in terms of kill rates uh, in 2015 so this isn't something that was just put together uh, within the last year or two it's been something studied previously uh, and achieves what we call a six log kill rate, uh, which is uh, sufficient to call it uh, absolutely safe from a bacterial and a viral perspective, uh, and this has been tested. Uh, and so this thankfully is technology that, that is uh, relatively more time tested over, over several years, uh, and then we're very grateful for the FDA's emergency use authorization that permits it uh, to, to be used. Uh, but again, in just in terms of expanding the available pool, not just within Partners Healthcare, but for all the hospitals uh, of the Commonwealth that are reaching out to be part of this process, th this really represents an opportunity to have more PPE for the frontline healthcare workers who need it uh, in, in ways we just cannot purchase on the market, almost irrespective of price. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have a question from a suburban resident um, asking about what safety measures are put in place to ensure that the I would not be the right person to comment on the technical aspects of that. Uh, I don't know, Chris, or we could, or, or do we want to have Greg? Greg, can I ask you to, no, I'm sorry, I, I can't. I, we, I'll, I'll connect you with someone to follow up or Chris. I'm sorry. There, there are people better equipped to answer that question here if you want to go into more detail after, but at least as I understand it, uh, the system is, is uh, sealed, uh, obviously, in its, uh, you know, conduct of its work. There's uh, uh, the uh, flow of the uh, uh, outside from the units. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, pressure going both ways. I don't know. Uh, we can we can talk to you afterwards if you want. Yeah. Okay. Let me just add that in addition, our staff, our team of inspectional services, public health inspectors, and board of health have inspected the site, played a role in maintenance stage in this area. We, it's been a certain and, and again confirmed there are no there are no dangers in terms of what's being emitted from here. Milford had put in a sizable order. Say again. Milford had put in a sizable order for PPEs from the federal. Uh, excuse me. They put in a sizable order. They say the federal government intercepted that order. FEMA was the organization that they had named. I reached out to FEMA today, and they said they're not taking order shipments that are planned for different communities. What are you hearing about situations like these, and anything you're going to do to help Milford and other communities? Was it the town of Milford or Milford Hospital? The town of Milford, and they were four Milford Hospitals. Okay, well, I'm not familiar with this one. I'll follow up on it. Obviously, um, there are many folks in the public sector who, over the course of the past several weeks, um, have uh, have had orders uh, disappear. So um, we'll follow up with Milford and see what the story is there. But um, look, I talk I talk to governors all the time, and um, well, I've had my own experience with respect to this, which I've spoken of. There are plenty of other governors who've had similar experiences, but we'll follow up with Milford. What's your reaction to losing that supplies? 30,000 gallons of yeah. Like I said, I'll talk to him about it and see what we can do to help him. The, um, the answer uh, is yes in both cases. Um, the DCU has started accepting patients. I think they started accepting patients on Thursday, right? 
um, and uh, BCEC started accepting patients last night. Um, well, at this point, they're pretty small. Um, the Newton Pavilion's also started to accept patients. Um, I think Newton has 22. Um, I think the BCEC at this point has a handful. And I think the number of Worcester is less than 10, isn't it? It is. Um, Cape Cod is going to be open probably Monday. Um, this is the beginning, folks. We've said this before. This is the beginning. The reason for creating this capacity, um, which has been an enormous amount of work by a lot of people, um, is to recognize and understand that we need a lot of empty staffed capacity to be available to deal with what we believe will be a very difficult next two or three weeks. Um, and this is what we've been planning for for the past several weeks. Last question. Governor, the president says that about the importance of allowing courses to allow them to be access to the testing at this level. Is that why you made that decision? Sort of the pressures that they're feeling inside the stores? Well, there's, um, first of all, there's a, a growing consensus about, uh, about this particular virus, that there is a significant a minority population, but a significant portion of the population who are not going to show symptoms. They will be infected, they are carriers, but they're not going to show symptoms. Now, that's an almost impossible number to figure out until you get testing in some part of the world to a level way beyond where it is now. Um, but the estimates range anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, depending upon who you talk to. Um, part of the reason we decided to put the advisory out on uh, masks or face coverings if you can't be um, in a situation or a circumstance where you can distance appropriately from other people is because of this issue of people who may be in fact infected but have no idea. Um, this goes both ways. The point behind the face covering is not just about protecting yourself from somebody else. It's also about protecting somebody else from you if you happen to be one of those people who doesn't know you've been infected because you aren't showing any symptoms. Now, it's going to take a while for everybody to ultimately figure out because, again, we're dealing with a new virus, an unprecedented um, circumstance here, what the actual size of the infected but not symptomatic population is. But there's no question at this point, based on what a lot of the experts are saying, they think it's a much bigger number than was originally anticipated. So part of the issue here about wanting people to wear face coverings or masks if they go to a supermarket or a pharmacy or some other place where they can't be sure about their ability to distance is to not just protect themselves from others but to protect others from them. Same goes with respect to uh, the guidance we put out earlier this week about limiting the number of people who could be in a supermarket uh, at any given time or a grocery store to 40 percent of the stated total occupancy of the site. Once again designed to create uh, distance, physical distance between people who are in their shopping and the people who are actually serving them. Um, and the decision we made to make the um, to make the sites, the testing sites, the drive-through sites at Gillette in Foxborough and at the Big E in West Springfield was specifically designed uh, originally for first responders, emergency responders, uh, but we expanded it based on some of the data and some of the discussions that we've had um, with folks in public health about the fact that grocery workers are exposed all day long to a lot of people who may not be symptomatic, uh, but may in fact um, be carriers and that's why that face covering is such a big and important issue here going forward. Governor, what's the latest on the situation? The president continues to say that the governor is not requesting much and everything they need to serve. So um, I think people know that we our original request, which we we believe was approved at one point, was for a thousand ventilators. Um, since that time we've received 200 ventilators and there are 200 more that are coming. Um, uh, I mean, we're pretty well confirmed. I mean, Secretary Sutters talks a lot about the fact that until it lands, it's not real. But I do believe the 200 additional ventilators are coming. Um, the message we got from the feds was that we would be receiving um, ventilators on an incremental basis. I mean, so far, they're living up to that. You know, they gave us 100. They gave us another 100. They've committed another 200. We're obviously going to continue to pursue uh, the full 1,000 that we believe we need. We're also 
pursuing a variety of uh, private sector channels um, that I believe remain promising as well. Um, but as Dr. Bittinger said, the whole process around, uh, around gear, however you want to define it, is one that we are working all the time, every day. We're still working, uh, we're still working channels on additional 95 masks, N95 masks. We think this is a terrific tool to help us create a much longer shelf life and useful life for N95 masks, but we're looking for more of those. We're also uh, pursuing gowns and pappers and, uh, and a lot of the other gear that uh, the people on the front lines are going to need. And we're going to continue to do that. So we've tried to be um, we've tried to be pretty clear in both our messaging, our guidance, our advisories, and our orders about uh, how important it is for people to maintain social distancing and to use good hygiene and to take these issues seriously and to understand and appreciate the fact, especially with some of this new knowledge coming out that implies significant portions of the population can in fact be infected, can in fact be carriers and show no symptoms, how important it is for people to use the face coverings and to socially distance and to use good hygiene. Um, I think in many ways, uh, based on what we have seen just generally out there, people have been pretty good about that. Um, but when we see things that concern us, we act on it. When we saw a lot of activity at the beach um, last weekend, which was a pretty nice weekend, um, we banned parking at the beaches. Uh, and we expected and we did see a number of um, waterfront communities follow our lead on that one. Uh, this weekend, we are shutting down a number of our parkways, something we did in conjunction with our colleagues in those communities uh, to make more space available for people to walk and to walk with distance if they need to go out. But the overarching message all along, and it's been one that the mayor and his colleagues in municipal government have shared time and time again, and that the lieutenant governor and I have discussed over and over with our colleagues in government and our colleagues uh, in the healthcare community is there's a reason why we've taken these draconian measures with respect to essential businesses. There are reasons why we've taken these measures with respect to stay at home and why we've been so aggressive about encouraging people to not go out unless you have to go out. I mean, we all get the fact that the economic impact of these decisions is profound, and that's playing out in the data. Um, but when you're dealing with something that's as contagious as this particular virus and is as deadly for certain populations as this particular virus, you have got to understand and recognize the role you can play in protecting not just yourself, but the other people you come in contact with. And, and I said the first time we limited gatherings and basically shut down uh, services and houses of worship, how brutal I knew that would be for many of my friends uh, and the people I know uh, for whom their faith is a core part of what they're about and those opportunities to practice shoulder to shoulder with their, uh, with their friends and their neighbors and their communities um, matters to them. But we just can't be doing that stuff now. And we especially can't be doing that stuff uh, as we head into this very difficult month of April, which is based on all the modeling that's been done, probably going to be uh, the toughest month for the people of Massachusetts. And, and one of the things I said yesterday, um, if in this holy week uh, people need to pray, I would urge them to pray for a lot of the folks who are going to be taking care of um, those who get sick, praying for those who do get sick, and praying for their families. Um, this is this is going to be a rough time, and I get the fact that it's a nice day, um, but people really need to accept the fact that, um, that this virus is, um, is insidious, in some cases is invisible, and, uh, and it will prey on people if you give it the opportunity. The best way you can kill it is to not give it to somebody else and not get it yourself.
And that means staying away from people for the most part, except those you may share a house with or an apartment, um, and really limiting your outdoor activities to those essential activities we've discussed before. And if you can wear a face covering or a mask when you can't social di socially distance, please do, because it will help not just you, but it will also help other people as well. Thanks, everybody.